Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. I'm sure people will keep coming into the room, but we'll get started and kick this off. My name is Jeremy Foyet. I am the co-founder of Milwaukee, and I am joined by Alexa from Meet on the Street. Uh, we are co-hosting a program. This will be reoccurring, and we'll do this every week, every other week, um, as long, when, whenever we get guests. Um, and the, the program was initiated by Alexa and I just talking about what can we do to spotlight small businesses and the stories behind them, but also the neighborhood. I think sometimes we get so focused on the individual that we don't talk about the neighborhood that the business might reside in. So we're going to dive into a little bit of that as well. Um, so welcome to the program, Caitlin, and welcome, Alexa. Do you want to uh, give us some initial advice or initial thoughts on the program? Yeah, so I'm just super excited to not only like dive into small businesses, um, but, you know, Jerry and I both being small business owners, I think we have questions that maybe others don't think about if you own a small business. So I'm really excited to be a part of it. We're obviously all still working um, through this craziness together and things are constantly changing. So should be some good conversation. Thank you. All right, Caitlin. So Caitlin is the owner of the Tanda Milwaukee, which started in 2016 and resides in the Lindsay Heights neighborhood. Um, big things have happened, but we're going to start from the beginning. So when you opened up the business, like in the beginning, like what was the mission or what was even the mission that started the whole concept of the business for you? Yeah, so um, we've always been a community social enterprise. So we're like a for-profit business. We don't make a whole lot of money usually. Uh, <laughs> our goal was always to help young people get into careers in um, the service industry, specifically like in uh, restaurant work. Mm -hmm. um, and th that really came about because I used to be a high school English teacher. I've always been a teacher by trade and kind of threw caution to the wind and decided to start cooking for a living when I moved to Milwaukee about seven years ago. Okay. And so uh, it just seemed like I was able to get a job with no experience and a fabricated resume because I could talk nice and I was white and was able to learn how to cook on the job. It just seemed really like a no brainer that in a neighborhood like Lindsay Heights where the unemployment rate is just staggering for people mm -hmm. who are young. Um, that'd be a really cool way to get some people into cooking. What about, um, you know, like for people that haven't been there, how long have you been open? And then can you talk about, I mean, obviously we're in a really weird point, but can you talk about some of the highs and lows during this uh, process? Yeah. So we opened in November of 2016. Um, and I think the whole process has been like an intense pile of highs and lows. So I, I'd be lying if I said that I thought we'd always been doing a great job. Like, I think we maybe have almost gone out of business down to the wire, like 20 times in a little over three years. I mean, literally like to the point where you're writing payroll checks on a Friday and just like thanking your lucky stars that most of the kids are cashing those at a cat check cashing place or the liquor store around the corner, because you know, you don't have to have money for those until Monday. So it gives you like three days to figure shit out. Um, and that's been a lot of the lows, but also that's been a lot of the highs. Like we have had a hundred and almost 150 kids work here in wow. the course of three years. And those young people have, some of them gone on to other restaurants. Some of them gone on to careers in the healthcare field. Um, some of them gone off to college. Some of them gone off to jail or prison, um, but I recently, actually right before this coronavirus shit popped off, one of the young ladies who started with us that first month in November uh, got hired at Sanford. Like, I can't get a fucking job at Sanford. And here <laughs> she is going in and, and really starting her career just two years, three years after being with us. So, yeah, I mean, it's an all highs and lows. People don't get into restaurants because they really like a steady job. Like it's a bunch of psychopaths who like to burn themselves and scream and run around like nut jobs. I'm glad our kitchens are similar because sometimes I feel like I'm the only one. It's <laughs> oh just like, God. the kitchen is literally burning down and I'm screaming and it's just, it's literally like the uh, gifts out there. Yesterday, the, the, we have, so all of our kitchen equipment is used and our, our model right now is very different. So luckily it wasn't like in the middle of service. It was just like prepping food. 
but the grill that we have is like 30 years old. I bought it used from some pole barn in Caledonia and one of the gas nozzles slipped and it was just a blowtorch. It was just shooting fire like, into the kitchen. That's what literally was. It was like actually what was happening. So it was, yeah, it's usually a lot of fire. <laughs> It's a very learn, it's a very learn on the job type of environment. Hey, everyone learned how to turn off a gas valve, which is a good skill to have. So as far as, can you talk about what you guys were doing as far as like concept service menu prior to COVID-19 and yeah. how that's all changed currently? What is your current business model? So we've always been a place where um, like your service might be great or might be terrible based on how long that person's been with us. And we've always been really transparent with it. You know, like you're going to, you come here when you have time to eat your staff, uh, the person who's serving you might, this might be their first day. Um, they might be in between housing and like sleeping on someone's couch for the past couple of months. They might be dealing with some really severe issues and learning to do a job at the same time. So, um, it, we always focused on like making it feel like eating in someone's home, right? To every extent, which is like, yeah, you're kicking it with your server. They might sit down with you and tell you about their kid. And the food is really comforting, really hearty stuff. Um, for every bit of fat there is, there's a bit of nutrition. Like our collard greens are chock full of bacon, but really it's a really healthy, homey, Southern style food to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always been the vibe. Like the drinks are really unassuming. Our bar is not like a full bar by any stretch of the imagination. It's always just like, what do you want? You want an old fashioned of some fried chicken? We got you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, the R and D that goes into a restaurant? I mean, I've been in the restaurant a few times, and you know, it has this old character. And I'm sure you've thought a lot about the process, especially with the business model and all these different uh, kids, as I call them, coming through and working for maybe the first time in a restaurant. How much research and development did you do before even opening it to know that that could work? Or was it kind of, I'm going to try this and prove everybody wrong type of thing? I thought I did a bunch and I did not do enough. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, I don't know. I got it into my head. Honestly, the restaurant came to me. So like I was looking at starting something on my own, but didn't really know why I'd only been cooking for like three years. I don't know how I got it into my head that I wanted my own place. And every day it seemed like someone came to tour this building that was getting redeveloped and said like, Hey, this isn't really a space for me, but I really think this is a place that this chick I know Caitlin would really like. And so the R and D came out of that. Like, there were several restaurateurs who wanted to get into this space and be a part of this restaurant um, and, you know, open up here in Lindsay Heights. And I had to fight for that position. And part of fighting for that was like getting to know my neighbors, not just like kicking it on the street and talking to the people who live in the community, but also I sat in front of a panel of like 13 neighborhood stakeholders, some really serious elders like Larry and Sharon Adams and had to feed them food. And they looked at me and they were like, yeah, this menu, it tastes great. You're not gonna sell this shit. You gotta pick something else. And I was like, are you serious? I thought this was great. They're like, no, what about chicken? So like we went back and forth forever to develop a menu that doesn't look anything now like it did when we started all of this because it was really important, I think, to the success of the business that like folks in the community were dug in what we were doing. I have a, just a question on that. What's the best thing besides the chicken? What's the best thing on the menu? And also what's one thing you put on the menu that everybody's like, nah, and you took it off. This is going to sound crazy, but I'm having trouble to remembering our menu because it has been a month <laughs> and a half of running. Oh, I, had to think, I was like, think quick, think quick. Um, I really love the pork shoulder. We only do that in the winter, but it's like a milk braised pork shoulder. It's got some bacon in there. Um, comes with like a cornbread dressing and mashed potatoes and Brussels sprouts. It's the ugliest plate of food I've ever put out. Like you, I can't make it look better. It's just a big pile of brown ass. It is so good. <laughs> yeah. And what was the other question? What do uh, I like? Just one thing you put on the menu, like this is going to kill it. And then people were like, no, oh, that just didn't buy it or it kind of fell off the menu. Uh, you know, I really thought chicken livers was going to be like our calling card. I just thought it was like, I love livers, especially when they're cooked right and marinated for long enough. And so 
And people just didn't order them enough. And like the people who did order them would be, thank you, Andy, those livers are the shit. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, someone would order a once in a blue moon and it just, I had to get rid of them. It's because you got to change the name. People don't know that they like something. They just assume because the word livers and they're like, no, I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to try it. Look, I'm going to tell you like the, the 60 plus crowd went crazy on the livers, but they were <laughs> all the you know, they're used to eating that kind of food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. Um, so can you, you talked a little bit about literally you've, like financially, I'm talking, I'm assuming you were talking about almost gone out of business, like oh, yeah. multiple times. And you're talking about during COVID or in general as a business? No, like in general as a business. Yeah. So I mean, COVID, that's- COVID showed up and I was like, shit, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> this is our demise, right? <laughs> So can you talk about like what those lows look like? Cause everyone jokes about keeping the lights on, but it's a literal thing. There was a winter where I fought to keep the lights on with We Energy is cause it just yeah. is that real. Can you talk more in depth about that? And then how do you continue to persevere through those times? Because they're really dark, low places. I feel like. I think if we were running like a regular business, um, we'd be doing a lot better. But it takes like a really, it takes a lot of courage for a young person to decide to be a part of like society as we think of it. To like, be like, man, I'm not going back to jail or no, I'm not going to rely on my parents anymore because I can't do that. I got to support myself. Like it takes a really big leap of faith for them to do that. And so I think a lot of our problems with our bottom line has always been like, when it is that slow month, I can't cut the hours of a single mother mm-hmm. supporting her kid. I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if I was maybe a more pragmatic business person, I, it, it wouldn't have been as tight as often. Like mm-hmm. we run a tight ship around here. We've got, we have a really low on the food waste end of things. Mm-hmm. We've got a really good handle on our bar inventory. We have a really steady customer base. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like, you can't, I can't, I can't have you take that risk just to tell you when it's not financially beneficial to me that you need to like go fly a kite. Mm -hmm. Um, And persevering in those times has been based on those young people that I really care about. Mm -hmm. Um, And just so everybody knows, you can ask questions. There's a, if you're in the audience here, there's a question and answer session and we can get to those. You can type those in or you can actually do those in the Zoom chat focus area. But um, kind of my next question really deals with what we're in now. I mean, when this happened and restaurants had to change, can you kind of just get real with people and tell what what you're going through and and what it's like on a day-to-day basis? Can you guys hear me? I think I just switched out. We can hear you. Did you hear anything I said? No. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. The internet here is really bad and there's like four people on it. Um, But we, there, during those times, it's been, um, you just, you persevere because it's what we're all doing together. Like we're in this as one group. And so I've gone and found caterings I haven't done in months from law offices that have given us a couple thousand bucks to do stuff before. And I'll call those people. I have no shame. I'll be like, Hey, it's a slow month customers aren't really coming in meanwhile you guys contract with us to do this stuff because you believe in what we're doing like you got any meetings you need food for and that has really helped keep it going the only thing that makes me really persevere though is like a fear of bankruptcy there's no way out of a restaurant once you're in you're fucked you're like totally trapped forever <laughs> not what i want to do <laughs> Bro, this is the fact the only way out is bankruptcy what who's going to be able to sell a restaurant in milwaukee to somebody it's, this is not New York City. This is not Chicago. It's not like you can establish a base and then find somebody to take over as an operator. I think the only place in town that I've ever heard of that happening outside of some of the Latinx places on like Mitchell and National is the National Cafe. That's the only, Mel's mm-hmm. the only person who's ever gotten off the hook of having a restaurant and gotten to get out of Dodge. Like, well, and she you're in it until it's over. Right? Yeah. So she has a huge asset there as well, which makes it, I think, much easier. Yeah. Um, you're just in until it's over. So the wheels fall off literally. Um, 
So we have some questions. Um, what Can you tell us about the current status of your restaurant? So what are you guys currently doing as of today for service? Yeah, so we are um, running a soup kitchen. We are donation-based. We serve uh, anywhere from 300 to 400 single portion hot meals a day. They're refrigerated, intended to be reheated at home with instructions on them. Um, and we've been doing that for about a month and a half. Mm -hmm. And then, um, will, oh, sorry, um, will Tandem remain open, like through COVID-19? Will we'll any restaurant remain <laughs> open? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, nobody fucking knows. I mean, even the best of the restaurants, like, there are groups that are huge, that are multi-million dollar enterprises that have thousands of employees in the metro area. I'm not sure every Colectivo is going to stay open. Like, this is a really hard time to be in this business. So I want to say optimistically, like, yeah, I was kidding. Like, ha, 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 we've been going out of business forever. This is not new to us. But I think we're <laughs> equipped to make it through. But it's really wild. So you I just had so. some, some new media come out around the world, uh, Central <laughs> Kitchen. Can you talk to people what that means? Because uh, I was, yeah. It means a lot. <laughs> so, um, a buddy of ours who's a DJ at 88.9 reached out to World Central Kitchen like on a day when he was feeling depressed about the future of Milwaukee and like the world. And they wrote his ass back. And I got to talk to these people and um, basically it, they're down to business. They're gonna pay us 10, box, 10 bucks for every meal we put out. And we just invoice them weekly. Um, and that's amazing. We have been subcontracting with a bunch of local restaurants since this started. So we have like 20 restaurant partners that we pay to help us fill our demand for meals. I'm going to say we're cold with the cooking, but there's only five of us in here. And there's no way in hell we're making 2,000 meals a week by ourselves. I don't mm -hmm. care how fast we think we are. And so we've been able to, we've been paying restaurants $5 to fill these containers, which is like good for cash flow, but hasn't been a proper valuation of their time at all and so now that we're getting we're able to invoice world central kitchen for our meals every week we can start paying our restaurant partners like a thousand bucks to give us a hundred meals that's crazy that's a really good profit margin and it's going to help them kind of keep their bottom line moving so it means a lot of good shit it means a lot and there's no timeline on it like the contract was very clear the contract was like we will pay you for meals till we don't want to pay you anymore and i was like great thank you for that clarity uh, <laughs> no seriously that, that could go on for a couple of weeks it could be a couple of months i have no idea but all i know is right now it's a huge weight off of us because it means we can keep scaling up how many meals we're putting out every week without worrying about that hurting our ability to keep doing this you know we were we've been doing for a month like 300 meals because i was worried we were going to run out of money and so like that was the limit like you just had to get here early you had to get your stuff but if i know that we have some financing on the back end of that a partnership on the back end we could really put out like the 400 500 meals that people need not just like what we can afford yeah, that's amazing. Congratulations, and thank you. Yeah, <laughs> also, I think maybe I could meet Jose Andreas sometime. Who knows? <laughs> that would be insane to Milwaukee. That'd be I amazing. I think we'd be great friends. <laughs> um, okay, so let's switch gears and talk about the neighborhood you're established in. So you, did you choose, did you know you wanted to be in Lindsay Heights, or was it more like the building kind of was like, no, this is it, and it, yes, it's in this neighborhood, but I'm going to rise to the challenge regardless? I didn't know shit about Lindsay Heights, so I've always lived in Harambe. Okay. Uh, and so that's like a couple neighborhoods over, but this is a very funny section of town that really is like only a couple square miles. It's mm -hmm. a pretty small neighborhood physically. Um, and really, like I said earlier, the building just came to me. The developer was looking for different restaurateurs who might want to put a restaurant in the space. And every time they came and looked, they were like, yeah, this place is great. That's not for me, but I know this one chick. And every time that chick happened to be me. Um, and so, yeah, Lindsay Heights just kind of happened to me. I didn't sign a lease or anything until I was here kicking it and talking to everybody and walking around and stopping folks at the out, what used to be the outpost, like slash juice, juice kitchen spot on North Ave. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just, yeah, it was completely accidental. 
Um, can you tell us about what's changed? You've been open since 2016. What it's you know, almost four years or three and a half years later. What's changed in the neighborhood, and what's kind of stayed the same? Um, I don't know. The neighborhood is always Lindsay Heights has been changing for the positive for 20 years. Before I even knew Milwaukee was a place outside of Happy Days. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the neighborhood has continued to progress. I think that the neighborhood is seeing more folks from outside of the neighborhood hanging out in it, which is a big change. I mean, Alice's garden across the street has always been a space for people from all over Milwaukee to do their gardening, to commune with nature, to commune with one another. Um, but I think maybe more folks are engaging in the neighborhood from outside of the neighborhood in a way they hadn't considered before. The juice kitchen was always such a strong pull. I mean, that, I mean, they were in the fucking New York Times. Like they've always been someplace that people from all over the city came to be a part of. And I think the more like we're here, the more there are spaces that are conducive to that, the neighborhood just continues to change its badass self into being better and better. Um, but it gets more support and gets more exposure. You know, I see like the mayor have lunch with some judges here. And like, that's really cool for Lindsay Heights. Mm -hmm. That's good for your staff and stuff to see too. I mean, that's just an accurate representation of everything you're doing in the community. Okay, we so had the, we, oh, I gotta say real quick, we had no, the had watch party for the primary before all this stuff started. And like one of my guys in the back, Trayvon, who's a young entrepreneur himself came out and was like, Mr. Mayor, good to see you again. Like chopping it up, like, <laughs> Bobby, what's good? And that, that I think is something that's kind of new to the neighborhood because of our I space. think that's amazing in the sense that a lot of the time young kids, especially young kids from areas that are deemed unsafe or violent or lower income, they don't get exposure like that. And so they don't get opportunities to enter. I'm from Oak Creek, so it was much different upbringing. Um, yeah. And I think it's important for the youth to have those types of interactions to know that it doesn't matter. Like you matter. I want to talk to you, um, which is amazing for them. Yeah. So if someone hasn't been to Lindsay Heights because there's all these stereotypes about it, um, what would you tell them and what would you recommend that they do or they see? I tell them to stop being a bonehead because the only reason <laughs> you're scared of places is because you don't understand them and you might act foolish. So be a little more open-minded. If it's a place that you don't know and you're a little nervous about because it's something that's unfamiliar to you, don't wander around at night looking at mm -hmm. your cell phone. But I would always say like, intro to Lindsay Heights 101, come here on a Saturday, go to the Fondy Farmer's Market. It is the best place on earth to be on a Saturday in the dead of summer. It is a cross section of the city. It is, there's music, there's food that you can eat right there. There's vegetables you've never seen before because the Hmong farmers bring some crazy shit I never even knew existed, like sour okra leaves. <laughs> um, stop by and check out what Venus has going on. The garden is always open door. She keeps that gate open every time she's in there. Mm -hmm. And you're also going to see a cross section of the city. You're going to see people who aren't afraid of bees. <laughs> it's a really cool <laughs> place to be. We started out with um, those people. Yeah, I mean, just literally walking up and down the block is fun. Like the juice kitchen is not in that space at 16th and North anymore, but Gals grocery store it looks like a little shitty ass hood grocery store, but that place has been there for like a hundred years. Mm -hmm. They have seen, I, we, I reached out to a farmer we use um, from up North scent graph farms. And when I first reached out and explained where my business was going to be set up, she started crying. Cause she was like, we have had a family farm business for a hundred years. We almost went out of business when the sixties and seventies took processed food and made them the, the mainstream for America. And the one place that continued to buy our shit through and through was the Gauss grocery store at 16th and North. I mean, this is like a community that's really dug in and it's a fun place to be. Plus they got a great chip selection and good yam. <laughs> that's a, a great story. Like who are some of the other people in the neighborhood that stand out to you that, you know, are kind of those neighborhood leaders, people that, you know, people talk about tell stories about or the people that are always around everybody man okay jack owns the liquor store at 16th and north and he is i gotta think about how to say this it doesn't get any of us in trouble is anybody on this chat a snitch <laughs> we don't know that <laughs> okay 
I have sent many of my employees to Jack's place to help me get supplies in times when we were busy, perhaps <laughs> a bottle of Hennessy or something. And he, he will let me work on credit. Like if I don't have cash to throw at a kid, I'll be like, and I'm not talking to a kid like somebody of age, like go over there, tell Jack we need a bottle of Hennessy now. You got to run right back over here and I'll be there when I'm off of work. Like he has cashed every check of every kid I've ever needed to have a check cashed. We had an older white guy who was living in River West who was working for us for a while. He was working through some drug issues. And I got a phone call from Jack as soon as that guy showed up with a payroll check. And he was like, Caitlin, I got a guy here. He's trying to cash a check of yours. And I was like, Jack, I know he doesn't fit that standard profile, but this guy does in fact work for us. Please cash his check for him. It's just like he has been in this community for more than 30 years. He's the guy you used to take a note from your mom to buy a pack of smokes from when you were nine years old and take them back home. There's a lot of great people in here. That's awesome. Anyone else come to mind? I've just continued. I love hearing stories about people in the neighborhood. I mean, I love everybody. You'd be remiss not to talk about Sharon and Larry Adams just because of like their long standing impact and the shit that's going on in this community. Um, but also like their humanity. I mean, Larry has been working on a building down the block from here. They founded the Walnut Way 20 years ago now, over 20 years ago. And they've been working on a building at the end of this block. And Larry comes in in the afternoon between three and four when he's in the middle of a construction project just covered in crap. He's, you know, on in his age. And he's still out here hustling every day, working his ass off out of building. And he'll come in and sit with me and talk to me about what's been going on this week and talk to me about the workers he has over there or what Sharon's getting herself into or about their kids. It's just like the people in this community are really awesome. That's amazing. And I love hearing, it's like old school Milwaukee, like how, you, how we, a lot of people used to do things. You used to barter, you used to trade. You'd be like, hey, we're good for it. I know they're good for it or this, whatever. With the check with the guy even like looking out for you. I mean, that's, it literally takes a village to run a business and to make it successful. And you've definitely set up a shop in a good one. I've traded half of a McDonald's coffee at the Fondy Farmer's Market for a pound of okra. That has been a physical transaction I've done. <laughs> the coffee vendor didn't show up one day. And so I was drinking my coffee and I went to buy some okra for some guy. And he was like, is that just like black coffee? I was like, yeah. He's like, I'll just give you the okra. The coffee that I didn't show up today. Can I please have that? And it was literally like, that's amazing. I will be one of those people that's like, you can have any free meat on the street food. I just, I need coffee. I can't get my hands on some. I appreciate yeah. the fun appearance, whoever that was. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one of our volunteers, Samara. She's really trying to freak everybody out. I didn't even notice the bunny. I was too busy talking. And now they're not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a fun place to be. You need to work in right now. Yeah. Um, Caitlin, how can people support you during this time? Because you are not open to the public for like yeah guys understand that Caitlin's not open for service at all she's just she's really just doing community work and making sure those that maybe can't have access to meals for whatever reason are getting them um so how can people donate and support you right now during this time yeah so we got two kinds of donations that we're taking right now um one would be like product so if you happen to be linked up in some sort of way or you happen to have a bleeding heart in some sort of way and you've got like extra money and you want to go buy a case of eggs mm -hmm. bring that we hand those out on the weekends or we get people who come at four o'clock and there's nothing left and we hand them a bag of potatoes some eggs some butter like stuff to just make it through mm -hmm. that's a really good way for people to get involved in a in a way that they can feel like they're touching something and we disinfect it so you're safe um otherwise it's money and i hate doing that because it's always money we have a donate button on the home page of our website but it, it as much as people are like, oh, everything will kind of be back to normal soon. Um, back to normal is not going to be normal for a lot of us for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're in the restaurant industry or think of the chick who works at the mall or mm -hmm. the movie theater or any place pretty much is not a salary job or a grocery store. Those jobs are not just going to come right back. No. Even if we just reopened as a restaurant when the all clear whistle blew, I would not be hiring back at full capacity. I might not be able to have a full dining room. People might not be able to go to the movies more than 20 at a time for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so these are folks who have no savings, have no safety net, and 
just like myself, have no plan outside of today and tomorrow and next week. Mm -hmm. And I really think we're going to see food insecurity um, and fear from a lot of people who are used to being a part of the system for a long time, a couple of months, you know, end of summer shit. And so mm -hmm. the longer we can go, I'd love for it to be August and for me to have 30 people in line, but that's not going to happen. And no. so we want to keep being able to do this as long as the need is this critical. Speaking of that, um, how do you see the industry changing after all this is over? So I was listening to um, a different guy talk and he was like, you know, a lot of automation is going to happen even within this food and beverage industry, which is almost anti-automation in a lot of ways. Um, so how do you see our industry changing, specifically Milwaukee general, after this is over? I think we'd be a bunch of fucking idiots if we didn't advocate for one fair wage and for health coverage for our employees. I think I know why I haven't done it all this time because it's a brainer to pay someone four dollars an hour and rely on the rest of their wages to be made up in tips. Mm -hmm. When it comes to filing for unemployment, that person's fucked. Yep. When it comes to needing paid time off from work because of a, a real crisis, that person has no options. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how it looks. I don't know how we change it. I don't know how in my restaurant at 18th and Fond du Lac, I can raise my prices so much that I might price out my neighborhood, mm -hmm. but I know that I need to advocate better for my employees. Yeah. And that needs to be something that's happening going forward. We switched, we have a staff of five and we had a long conversation two weeks into this. And I said, I'd like to pay you a salary. I think that salary is what we can afford at this point, this X amount of money per week. You get 14 paid days off. So if you are worried that you're sick because of the virus or because of something else, I want you to take that time and get healthy. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to come back because this is a long haul. And we've never done that before. Yeah. And that felt like the right thing to do for the first time. And so I think the industry has to address that because look, we're employing half the goddamn country. <laughs> like literally, you look at it statistically, oh. we're employing like 40% of the nation, the restaurant industry. And it's not crazy because you know it. It's McDonald's is part of it. Applebee's yeah. is part of it. But small business is a huge part of it. We need to start advocating for our people better so that the next time this comes around, because this is not the only time this shit's going to happen. I don't know. I mean, it's not, not going to be this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it might get better for a couple months and it'll get worse again. Mm -hmm. Like our insurance policies don't cover any of this. Oh we need God. to start thinking long game and like how we provide for our people because mm -hmm. our people are us. We do have um, someone, um, Tracy from New Life. Is it possible that Farm Fork Catering would um, love to contribute some cookies for meals? We would love cookies, Tracy, and I'd love to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, just wrap them up individually. Like I, we usually wrap them in three packs and we just hand them out with the meals. It's a lot of kids out here and the kids love cookies. We have another question from the audience uh, for Chris. He says, how has working with younger entrepreneurs helped bring a fresh perspective to you and the business? I think it reminds me to hustle. Like we've been in this three years doesn't seem like a long time, but you get into some patterns and some routines and some of those are ruts. And then seeing someone like work this job, work their second job and try and make their food business on the side at 18 really reminds you, you're not dead yet. Like keep trying to figure out the best way to do this and advocate for what you wanna have happen. I have a question about your staff. So we hire a young staff too, it's just preferred, but we definitely don't hire from the Lindsay Heights neighborhood in the sense that like, not that we won't, but go ahead. Do you wanna answer that real quick? I, no, get I don't know. What do you guys want? Yeah, leave, please. I don't know why you're standing here. Go, bye, love you, have a good day. I, I, was, wondering why everyone, I was wondering why everyone was standing around. Say bye to everyone, bye. Because they were just standing around waiting for me to like. <laughs> what? So a lot of people I'm sure are wondering like, how was it like training somebody who maybe was previously incarcerated? And have you had any issues regarding that? Because there's all of these stereotypes, right? Hard, they're untrainable, they're not going to work right, they're going to steal from you. And I'm sure that happens regardless, in my opinion. Yeah. How have I you dealt with that? Yeah, I think it's tricky. Um, so we don't ask people about their 
uh, criminal history when we hire them because mm-hmm. um, I don't really care. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's been good points and bad points. I mm-hmm. think like, when you give somebody who has a armed robbery conviction a chance to work in a cash business, you're taking a risk. But also when you give anyone a chance to work in a cash business, you're taking a risk. And Funny. I think when they have that opportunity to not be looked at as some sort of monster, mm-hmm. uh, they behave in kind. You know, people are happy to like be given an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I will say when we first opened, my kitchen was full of big dudes who were felons. Mm-hmm. Like big dudes. And so it was very funny like because they like take you I'm, out in a moment's like, notice. Big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and they were they're all young. They were all like under twenty eight years old. But they had done some serious not serious time, but four, five, six years and had just gotten out the joint, most of them. Yeah. And the interesting part of that conversation was like I clearly was the authority because I cut the check. And mm-hmm. I'm nice to you. And I gave you a loan to get your first car, like there's a lot of relationship we would have that would make whatever I said kind of work. Uh, but you would see them go back to these old patterns of being like their physical size determining how people interact with them. Mm-hmm. There's this one guy, may he rest in peace because he passed away this, this past couple months. He, he was big. And so he'd be like, bro, do me a favor, go grab that out of the basement. No one wants to run the stairs and go to the basement but like everyone was jockeying for like their size and their power. And I was like, we are not in prison anymore. No one gives a fuck how big you are. Go get your own egg, you know? <laughs> it was tough. Uh, that took some adjusting, but we got there. I think final question here, wrapping this up, is what would Caitlin 2020 tell Caitlin at 2016 when you started the business? Uh, (laughs) don't do it run no i'm just kidding kidding. um don't cry as much like i'm not i don't feel ashamed of crying but like take every time it felt like it was gonna be an insurmountable obstacle we made it through Mm -hmm. like that time of grief and and panic was real but sometimes it completely undid me and so to know that like every time that feeling was overwhelming we would still persevere and figure it out would have saved me like a lot of headaches a lot of stress and anxiety yeah like a lot of (laughs) sleepless nights and it would have never stopped because a lot of those have been related to the young people i'm working with watching someone go down a bad path again or make the wrong decision Mm -hmm. um and that's a grief that you're going to have in life no matter what but just keep trying eventually you're going to be kicking it with jose andreas people are going to think you're cool no i'm just kidding oh my God. Uh, just keep trying it's a big deal it's a big just deal i'm not surprised all of your caitlin you are probably one of the most selfless chefs i have ever met i am not anywhere near as selfless as you so i thank you for being that role model um, to our I community always- I always say I was raised Catholic when Mother Teresa was like really hot. You know, she was was doing her thing. I was doing projects about her in school and I just got trapped. The modern day Mother Teresa. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time too. I know you got all this other craziness going on, but thank you. This is fun. I got to drink a beer. It is happy hour. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Caitlin, and thank you for everybody attending. Um, We'll have another session next week. Um, If you want to sign up for the Milwaukee newsletter, uh, go to our website. We send out every Monday a list of all the programs. These programs are hosted on the Cloud Cafe, where we do about six to eight programs a week on a variety of different programs. Um, This forefront one is something we're exploring to really tell these stories and tell stories about the neighborhood. I think it's really important that we support anyone. Any last parting shots, Caitlin, that you want everyone to know that's on here about the restaurant? No, I just want to keep reminding people like this shit is going to go on forever. Do what you feel is right and do what you can to help people around you. And that could be very simple, but just remember to love each other because it's going to get scarier. Like people are going to get tired and they're going to get crabby and people are going to start acting reckless. And the only way to ensure that that doesn't undo all of us is to keep being the person you want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk soon. Thank you, guys. It's a lot of fun. Bye. Bye.